So we were at accountability and responsibility. And I was saying that they are like brothers and, um, you know, they are related. However, certainly they are two different concepts, but they're related. And responsibility is, it <coughs> pertains to the task assigned to us, you know, just mute your mic, please. Mute your mic. Okay. So responsibility pertains to the task assigned towards completion of the task in an appropriate manner and accountability pertains to how the job is done and the completion of the assigned task within specified bounds. Now, social service organization and accountability. Now, what it is, I like the corporate sector, like the normal you know, world where everyone is accountable. We spoke about accountability, individual accountability. Like again, another example that's coming to my mind of individual accountability is obviously all of us are accountable to the society. All of us are accountable to our neighbors to the extent that we maintain peace within our, you know, our neighbors. We do not interfere with, you know, we do not interfere with them unnecessarily and we do not, you know, be a cause of nuisance to someone. So that's accountable. Why? We are accountable to the society. We are accountable to the law. We are to live as civilized people. So that's the reason we cannot just meddle into the affairs of someone. We cannot do whatever we want, even in our own house. Like, for example, we cannot play music loud beyond, say, 11 p.m. night or, you know, 12 a.m. midnight. We're not supposed to do that because it's going to disturb our neighbors. We are accountable for, you know, public peace. We're not to be, uh, you know, be a nuisance. So again, that's illegal. You know, nuisance again is an offense, depending upon, of course, depend depending upon the jurisdiction whether they would regard it as just a tort, that is a civil wrong or a criminal wrong. Well, we'll not go into that. So talking about accountability of social service organization now, again, it's generally normally, as I said earlier, it's, you know, it's, it, they, they, they normally, you know, try to connect it to financial accountability. When it comes to social service organization, they say, okay, they think of the finance that is given to them. They think about the, uh, you know, the, um, the donations that is given to them. So how well do they appropriate their funds? How do they use their funds? So the accountability of social service organization generally is seen in terms of financial accountability and the allocation of funds received by them for social causes that they represent. So thereby, a social service organization bears its accountability to its stakeholders, its beneficiaries, that is, who is benefiting out of it. Uh, of course, the clients of the social service organization, they are the beneficiaries the government, its employees, and the law. The accountability scheme aids in keeping checks and balances in the system, mitigating risks or reducing risks, avoiding frauds, misappropriation of funds, and so on. ASPRANSA EAP, that is abbreviated ANSA hyphen EAP in 2010, this, it's, an enabling environment for social accountability of charitable or social organizations. They said that it has four pillars, social accountability of a charitable or a social government organization. They said that it has four pillars. As per their treatise, they said that it has four pillars. Now, what are those pillars? The first pillar is community groups. That is efficient community groups gather information about government programs and services by engaging public officials, politicians, and service providers. And then second pillar they say is 
a vigilant government, a government that is alert. Social accountability and community participation should be reflected at the highest level here, where such government funded organizations must inculcate the system or, you know, must, um, you know, develop the habit of, you know, using the system of or you know develop the habit of being sensitive to the pressing social demands and be responsive they should inculcate the system of being sensitive to the pressing social demands and be responsive the third pillar again here is access to free information that is monitoring and evaluation of social services Sorry, teacher. must be yes teacher I repeat again uh... There is the bill of the second bill. Of okay, okay. I'll come back to that, okay? I'll do that. I'll finish the fourth and I'll just go all over again. I'll repeat it for you. Okay, okay. Okay. So we're talking about the third pillar that is access to free information, okay? Monitoring and evaluation of such institutions must be carried out based on authentic information maintained as records and made available from time to time, thereby increasing the organization's credibility. And the fourth pillar is understanding the importance of such a mechanism, of such a social accountability mechanism. That is the significance of accountability and transparency is at the core of effective functioning of a social service organization like mismanagement, corruption, and such kind of factors or allied factors must be kept at bay. That, it matter. that means it must be kept at a distance and avoided at all costs. Okay, so let's go back to the previous slide. Okay, so I'm repeating again for you. As for answer EAP 2010, an enabling environment for social accountability of charitable or social government organization has four pillars. What they're trying to say here is, according to ANSA EAP 2010, the social accountability of charitable or social government organizations has four pillars. Okay, now what are those pillars? One is community groups. What are, who are there in these groups? Of course, it depends upon what program it is. It, 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 it includes public officials. It includes politicians. It includes professionals. It includes service providers, again, who may be professionals or it may be any other kind of service. Or what, for example, I'm saying, for example, uh, say the students community. Example, students community students who belong to schools. Now there is a free food you know, distribution for schools that are, set, that are set up by the government in a rural area, okay? So that is a community, students' community. So children below, example, who are below the age of say 14 or 15. So they go to schools sometimes even, I mean, it depends how it is. So sometimes even 16, it depends, whatever. So they have to be in school. So it's for school children. So that's a community group, the schools. So now again, the first pillar is whatever community group the social service organization is catering to. So who is a part of the community groups? Of course, the students community, the school organization as school as a whole, of course, or it could be group of schools in a particular rural community, or it could be group of schools in a particular territory or an area, it depends what it is. So community groups. Now, when I'm talking about free distribution of food, how are you going to do it? Now, we are talking about community groups and we are saying that, yes, we are going to distribute free food for our children who are you know, students in these schools. And they are going to have you know, free lunch or a brunch, whatever is distributed to them. when during the school hours when they are having a recess or when they're having a break. So how are you going to do that? You are a social service organization. Are you going to sit and prepare yourself? Obviously not. 
You're going to have service providers. You're going to contact, you know, hotels or canteens or probably you yourself, you know, as a social service organization would arrange cooks. And again, they would, you would set up a team there who would, you know, whatever, bring whatever material is required for cooking and serving or whatever is a dish, whatever it is. So you would have service providers. It could be in the form of canteens, hotels, or, you know, what they say, uh, you know, caterers, it depends. So of course they are service providers. So it, it could include even politicians. It could include even professionals. It could include even public officials. Now talking about professionals, for example, um, you, you know, as a social service organization, you say, okay, apart from giving free food, we also would want to uh, have, a, you know, a free medical camp for all the students in this particular area of these, of, you know, this particular schools, this number, particular number of schools. So then you set up a medical camp for that you need doctors, right? So now you are a social worker. You might belong, I mean, you are part of an organization. You want to set up a medical camp. Now medical camp, who has to be there? Professionals have to be there, doctors have to be there, medical practitioners have to be there. So that's how it is. So the, the first thing, the first pillar we are talking about is community groups. So they also are answerable in simple terms. So they also are accountable. So how does a social service organization function? It certainly functions with the help of certain groups. What are those groups? Community groups. How are these communities formed? Whom do they cater to? Who is the beneficiary there? And also which community it is? Next, the second pillar would be, of course, the government itself. Everyone needs a government that is responsive. We need a government that is responsive, that acts. A government that is vigilant. I said a government that acts, A-C-T-S. It acts upon its words. We need a vigilant government. So social accountability and community participation should be reflected at the highest level where such government-funded organizations must inculcate the system of being sensitive to the pressing social demands and be responsive. So vigilant government, they might set up social, uh, you know, government-funded organizations and these government-funded organizations, social service organizations must, you know, inculcate or include in their system uh, you know, sensitivity or being sensitive to the pressing social demands or the demands in the society which are, you know, which are much needed to be catered to or, or, at, the, or at the fore or, at, or needs to be really addressed rather. So, for example, there is illiteracy. So that's a concern, a matter of social concern. So what are the press, pressing social demands there? So they need, need to be sensitive to social demands, especially pressing social demands, and then be responsive. Naturally, they have to be responsive. They have to act on it. That's why they are there. So we are talking about vigilant government as a second pillar. The third pillar is access to free information. Of course, communication and access to free information is an important key to successful running of an organization or you know, a sector as well. So therefore, the third pillar here is social serve in, in, in the social service sector with respect to social accountability is communication and access to free information. Information should be freely available. So monitoring and evaluation of such institutions must be carried out based on authentic information, the right information that is authentic, not just hearsay or someone said something and I just heard of something. 
but authentic information, something that is authentic and which is maintained as records and made available from time to time, thereby increasing the organization's credibility, so access to free information. And the fourth pillar is understanding the importance of such a mechanism. What me which mechanism? Social accountability mechanism. The significance or the importance of accountability, transparency is at the core of effective functioning of a social service organization. Mismanagement, corruption, and such allied factors must be kept at bay, that means at a distance, and certainly avoided at all costs. Therefore, accountability in social service sector is a sequinon for the effective working of such organizations, which in turn yields overall development of the society and effective delivery of social projects. So this is it with respect to organizational accountability in the social service sector. The next one is, I mean, a very short topic that is, I mean, you could build your answer and you have already done assignment on that. I've seen that some of you have already submitted your assignments and I've extended the date to the 5th of September. So that will be the last date. So the future of social service organization. Okay. Now, the future of social service organization seems to be optimistic. How does the future look like to you? It is optimistic. We are optimistic that social, the future of social service organization is great. We are optimistic that it's going to develop, it's going to grow even more. And of course, it seems to be that it would be characterized by adaptability, dexterity, and speed. It's going to pick up speed. So there is a paradigm shift that is already rampant and apparent in the sector. That means there is a, a kind of a shift at a different level that is already seen around, rampant, that you can see around everywhere, that you can really see, clearly see in the sector involving professionals, you know, they have started involving professionals of various backgrounds, such as law, engineering, medicine, therapists, and so on. And they've included them in the social service sector. And they started hiring their services, not just as, you know, external advisors or external, uh, you know, professionals who are in touch with the organization on as and when basis, but in fact, they started employing their services in-house. Are you understanding me? So now the social service sector has come up to the level, or as of today, 2022, the social service sector, you know, have started employing professionals within the organization. And, uh, you know, they have lawyers, they have, uh, de depending upon the departments, they have lawyers, engineers, uh, you know, doctors, therapists, where they are employed within the organization. So social service organization has grown, the social service sector has grown over the years and it has included every professional so that it's easy for them to, to cater to the social needs of the society or pressing demands of the society. So some prominent organizations or, you know, have begun paying their team members a high salary, almost at par with the corporate sector. And this has encouraged professionals from different fields to join the sector and knowledge transfer has begun prolif proliferating the sector. What we're talking here is that Social service organizations, see, for example, when someone talks about joining a social service organization, everybody says, okay, well, I don't think they're really going to pay us very well. But these days, if you really look around and if you look at, you know, the, the job opportunities that are coming up in the social service sector, the social service organizations or, you know, whatever kind of organization they may be, or even a philanthropic organization or human service organization, they have begun paying their team members or their employees rather a higher salary, 
almost at par, that we're almost equal to what is really available in the corporate sector, what is normally given to uh, you know, the employees in the corporate sector. So they've grown to that level and they're paying good salaries these days. So this has encouraged professionals from different fields to join the sector and knowledge transfer has really begun proliferating the sector. Like for example, you see, it depends again from country to country, jurisdiction to jurisdiction and how it is. Like in some countries, uh, you know, government hospitals, you know, are considered prestigious and government hospital doctors, for example, are paid, you know, very well compared to the private sector. In some countries, you know, the private hospitals pay very well compared to the government hospitals. Again, in some countries, or maybe rather, I would say that in countries where, um, you know, where the government doctors are not paid much, but they may have some other kind of benefits, long-term benefits uh, with respect to, you know, they might have pension schemes, and uh, you know some other benefits that may be granted to them, like unlike the private sector. So you, you could say that private hospitals, for example, may pay more. I mean, the take-home salary could be more, but uh, you know the benefits, long-term benefits, may not be really there. But the government doctors may have a nominal income. However, they have long-term benefits that are provided by the government to them because it's a government hospital. So again, it depends. So thinking of social service organization, there was there, normally there was a feeling, I believe some time back that, oh, it's a social service organization and normally they wouldn't really pay much. And it depends whether a person is you know, really volunteering. And when you talk about social service organization, everybody talks about volunteers. Of course you have volunteers as well, but, um, Today, what has happened is apart from having volunteers, you they started, you know, bringing in professionals into their team and you know hiring them as employees directly, and even they are paying them very well, just like the corporate sector, just as private sector, they started paying very well. Now, corporate sector includes, of course, even government companies as well as private companies. But I'm, we are just talking about generally the corporate sector because they pay well. So this has encouraged professionals from different fields to join the sector and knowledge transfer has begun proliferating the sector. That means it has already entered the sector. You know, it, it has begun seeping into the sector. So the approach has shifted from the next aspect here is the approach has shifted from you and they to we and us. Instead of talking in terms of you and they, now the approach has become we and us, thus encouraging world committee, a world unity, world brotherhood, world committee in the matters of major social concerns such as racism, poverty that are still prevalent in the pockets of the world, et cetera. Poverty, for example, or some other social concerns maybe that you see the world has got together. Countries have got together for in supporting a particular social cause or fighting against something that is not right. For example, illiteracy or female uh, literacy campaigns. They say girls need not be educated and so on and so forth. So they say, no, no everybody is entitled to being uh, equipped with education. Or they say that ladies are normally not given, uh, you know, good pay or, you know, a right job at the right place. I mean, in certain uh, countries or, you know, small pockets, not just countries, in small pockets of the world, it is still, you know, a matter of concern and it is still prevalent till today where not all are encouraged so well so the world is united saying that no everyone should be paid equally and everybody should be educated it's just a matter of interest of a person and if they are really interested they have to be well equipped with education and if they cannot afford it so there are of course you know that there are schemes of you know um granting them discounts in 
uh, school fees or college fees and university fees and so on, or some of them, you know, when it comes to schools, it was totally free education and so on, government aided schools, which are there and so on. Well, so the approach has of course shifted from you and they to we and us, thus encouraging world committee. Committee, C-O-M-I-T-Y. Next is leadership crisis in the sector. Which sector? The social service sector is being addressed at the moment. I mean, they are trained, the top level management or the middle level management, they are trained. And now you've already studied what kind of leadership models are available and what is really relevant to the social service sector. So leadership crisis seems to have been addressed as of today and the concept has transitioned to a more ubiquitous model in the sector that is self-leadership model as well as distributed leadership model. Now, this brings us to another concept of ONA. Of ONA. What is ONA? O stands for organizational, N stands for networking, S stands for software. So O and S, I'm sorry, it's O and S, not A. It's O and S. There's uh, you know a type a typo there. So O and S, that is organizational networking software. Now that is a technology that helps track organizational networking connectivity and communication. Now networking and building connections are the present day agenda. We all know that. However, the future again seems positive even for the social service sector with rapid explosive networking intelligence systems that may replace the present day or that may replace today's ONS, organizational networking software. And that would enable swift people and knowledge transfer, thus addressing key factors, hindering social progress and social development projects. Next is screening investors. Seems to be yet another promising move in the direction of fortifying or strengthening the social service sectors. Normally, uh, once upon a time, any and every investor was you know, invited. So, so long as you're ready to invest in a social project, okay, come, uh, I'm ready to include you uh, and please come and you know, shell out some money and invest in our project. So these days they have become you know, more cautious and there is background checks being made of even the investors, like why you want to invest, who are you basically, and what is your source of income? Whether at all what you're investing is legitimate source of income, because the, the social service uh, you know, sector is regulated as well. So screening investors seems to be yet another promising move in the direction of fortifying the social service sector. Next is social service governance and social accountability have propelled value-based delivery in the sector. This will continue to refine in the years to come with new regulatory mechanism, both domestic and international, and that may be devised and promulgated, or that may be really announced. It has to be uh, devised, drafted. The new laws have to be made and promulgated. Next is strategizing a roadmap into the future intensive drives to work towards social advancement and addressing major roadblocks of sustainable risks and strategically devising appropriate action, of course, will continue to go a long way in concretizing the current structural efforts in the sector. That's all about the future of social service organization. In case we get disconnected, please join back. Now you can take just to, do you want a break or let us continue? You want me to continue or you want to take a break? Now what remains is just a discussion about your exams. Do you want a break or you want to continue? Ah, okay. So in case continue, continue. continue. Okay, good. That's good. One minute, please.
Okay. So in case we get disconnected, please join back. Now we are talking about your exams. Okay. One minute. Just join back, please. 